Hi everyone, my name is Emily and I'm an Outdoor Education Specialist at Quimac Outdoor School. Today we're going to be talking about plant identification techniques that might help you and your students identify plants on the trail. As outdoor educators, we're always telling our students to pay attention to their surroundings and take note of as many details as possible. And this is a key component to plant identification. While the topic of plant taxonomy is very broad and in-depth, today's goal is to focus on some of the most important details in plant identification, although all details are important. So if you look at a plant for a day, you're probably not getting a full picture of what this plant is. Plants cycle through phases, usually over the course of a year, and those phases are typically uh, simplified to leafing, flowering, and fruiting. You're not usually going to have the luxury to observe this plant for an entire year. So what do you do when the leaves have fallen, the flowers have turned to fruit, and the fruits have shriveled and fallen off the tree? What do you have then? As our students always love to say, just a bunch of sticks. So then growth habit becomes incredibly important. How is it growing? Is it growing up toward the sky? Is it bunched up like shrubs? Is it growing upward, hanging downward, crawling, climbing? What is your plant doing? You might not even see anything above ground. Maybe you have to go back to your roots. Is it really an extensive root system leading it to be a perennial? Maybe it's even a bulb. That means it's growing year after year after year, whereas an, an annual dies after one year, and that's going to be a very shrimpy looking root system. Now, since some plants don't lose their leaves, leaf shape is the next most important thing. And it's incredibly important for identification, especially if it looks as unique as this leaf. What does this leaf remind you of? It reminds me of a goldfish. Sure, botanists have all these fancy names for the leaf shape, but most of them are fairly intuitive. Just take note of the shapes that you know. Also take note of the margins. So the, there's patterns along the side of the leaves. Take note of those as well. Next, zoom out a little bit and see how those leaves are arranged on the stem. The most common is alternate, where they alternate along the stem. A little less common is opposite, where they're paired along the stem. Some plants that employ this technique are monkey flowers, penstemons, and of course mint. Next is whorled, where the leaves are whorled along the stem, and you're often going to see this in lilies. Finally, you have the basil leaves. These are the ones that grow from the base of the plant, and you're going to see this often in violets, orchids, and the unique fan shape of the irises. Check the texture of your leaves, particularly in basil leaves like these. A single flower emerging from the basil leaves is there to attract pollinators without any other distractions. But if you zoom in on this one, and you see these little bumps that are actually like sticky hairs. The sticky hairs can be deadly to pollinators if they get stuck in them. If this is the case with your plant, your plant might be carnivorous. So instead of um, being there to not distract your pollinator, it's there to not eat the pollinator because this plant still needs to reproduce. It still needs a pollinator. So this is a one-time chance to get that pollinator over with no intention of eating it. And now you have narrowed your search because you know this plant is carnivorous. If your leaf bands run parallel, then your plant is part of a relatively small group of plants called monocots. And these monocots include lilies, irises, and grasses. And then there's palmate venation where the veins of your leaf run similar to the palm of your hand. There's one point from which the veins radiate. 
And then there's pinnate venation, where there's one mid vein, and from that, smaller veins branch off. It could be possible that one of the plants that you're looking at doesn't have leaves that resemble the rest. And this is a good identification piece. So Ceanothus, or the mountain lilacs, is identified for its three mid veins. So it's actually a pinnate leaf, but there are three mid veins that kind of make it look pomate. By definition, a leaf grows axillary of a bud. So there's a bud right here, and this whole leaf is coming out of it. Notice how there's no bud here. That means that this is a leaflet. It's one little leaf that is composing a much larger leaf. The example on the right is pinnately compound. So just like pinnate venation comes off of a main mid vein. Whereas the one on the left, palmately compound, is coming out of one central point. You might see palmately compound leaves from lupins, and you might often see pinnately compound leaves in roses. A flower, by definition, is a single reproductive structure of a flowering plant, which usually includes sepals, petals, stamens, and or pistils. So we might need to start changing our perception of what we see as a flower. Because most people would look at this flower and say, well, it's a flower. But is it? If you look carefully at the center of the flower, there's a bunch of miniature flowers, and they're all containing their own sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils. Even more mind-blowing is that the petals of this flower are actually petals to their own singular flowers. So let's start talking about some of the structures that make up a flower. So first, the sepals. This is the most outermost whorl of the flower. And in the case of monkey flower, there are five sepals. So start counting how many sepals you see when you're identifying plants. And then also look at the structure of these. The sepals on monkey flower are pleated, which is only seen in monkey flowers. And then there's tepals. Tepals are a type of sepal that looks exactly like the petal, and this is seen in lilies very often. So how can you tell that these tepals are sepals and not petals? Well, you can tell because if you look really carefully, those tepals are on the outside of the petals. So they overlap just slightly, but that's how you tell they're on the outermost whorl, they must be sepals. Petals are the most common and familiar part of the flower. Five petals is very common, but more or less is not, which makes it a really, really good identification piece. There are some oddballs, um, for example, uh, these legumes. Now, legumes are a very widespread and huge family, so I felt like they were worth talking about. They do have five petals, but in a very different format than what most people are used to. Um, they have this banner wing keel structure. So the banner up at the top is one petal, and then the wings along the side are two petals. And then there are two fused, often fused petals at the bottom called the keel, making up five total petals. Beware the poppies. Poppies can be pretty tricky to identify how many petals there actually are. Take a look at this California poppy in front of us and count how many petals you see. So you're noticing maybe, because we've talked about tepals, that there's two petals petals um, in the back and two in the front. And you might think, oh, well, there's only two petals and there are two tepals. Well, actually, beneath this picture, there are two deciduous sepals. So that means that these sepals fall off of the plant relatively early on, so you don't see them. So then what's this overlapping we're seeing? Well, there are two sets of two petals in a poppy. And this is pretty consistent among poppies, including 
the Dicentra, which is in the poppy family. Um, this one has not lost its sepals. You see the sepals right here, um, but they will eventually lose them. And then there's two pairs of two petals. Here at the base of this poppy, you can see the scars where those sepals have fallen off. Look for those sepal scars to help you identify your plant. Next piece of the puzzle are the stamens, pollen producers. Stamens can be, make a really big difference in what you're seeing. So we have four petals in each of these plants, but count how many stamens you see in each of them. The one on the left has eight stamens, while the one on the right has four plus two, six stamens total. Four large ones, tall ones, and two short ones. Telling us that this one on the left is from the evening primrose family, and this familiar one on the right is from the mustard family. Now that you know what you know, what family is this from? How many petals? How many stamens? That's right. It's from the evening primrose family. Also look at how the stamens are uh, structured. So there's a famous structure um, that's a bunch of fused stamens making a stamen tube. And this is always seen in the hibiscus family. Also note if they're coming out of the petals or from somewhere much lower in the plant. The pistil, or the female reproductive part of the plant, contains an ovary. Ovary position is really important in plant identification. In this fuchsia on the right, you see the ovary right there, just on the outside of the floral world. This is called an inferior ovary because if it were turned the way most flowers are turned, the ovary is now inferior to the floral parts. If it's superior, it's inside of those floral parts, so you're more than likely not going to see it. If you can see half of it, it's considered half inferior. This is the pistil, and you're going to want to count how many pistils you see on the plant. So in the case of this lily on the left, you see one pistil, while you see seven pistils on this nigella. Last thing you want to count are the carpels, and that's going to be usually pretty hard to do without actually slicing the fruit or the ovary itself. But you can see here that there's four carpels that make up this tomato. Four sections. Then zoom out a little bit and see how those flowers are arranged on the plant. You can see anywhere from the single flower that we talked about earlier to the composite inflorescences. So how um, those sunflowers or sunflower relatives are arranged with a lot of tiny flowers in what looks like a much bigger flower. This coiled cyme is an inflorescence known for being in Boraginaceae, the Borage family. Dichotomous keys are one of the best ways to identify plants. You would start with one and one prime, and you would read the descriptions that they contain. So right here we have one and one prime, and one is saying is able to, available for examination without flowers, and specimen one prime says available for examination with flowers. So if you see flowers on your plant, you're automatically going to choose one prime. And then you're going to compare the next number. So seven and seven prime, which is further down this page. If you like, there is this huge book I like to call the plant Bible, and this is all the plants in California, and it's filled with dichotomous keys. And so this is a really, really handy tool in the field, although it's very heavy. Um, and then if you would prefer an online version, you can follow the link up above, and um, you are going to be able to get most of what's in here online. Um, other things about this that's very cool is, uh, 
now that you are able to identify some key traits about certain botanical families, you can even skip this part of the key and go straight to genera within the family that you suspect your plant is in. So it will save you a lot of time. You may have also heard of iNaturalist, the citizen science app that takes your data that you've entered and it goes into biodiversity studies. Now, when you post these pictures or this information, people in the community identify what you've seen. And so now that you know which pieces are most important, you know um, where to kind of fix in your camera when you're taking pictures or what notes to leave in the comments um, to help the community identify your plant as well. The more information, the better. So if you've seen the Martian, you know it's very lucky to be a botanist and those botany powers are definitely things to be feared. And now you have them, so please use them well. Thank you guys, have a good day.